Okay, so um, what I'm going to do in this class is I'm going to very quickly go over some of the concepts that were discussed in chemistry class today. And I'm actually going to start sharing my screen and turn on the whiteboard. Okay, so if there are any important concepts that I feel need to be written, I can just type them up here in the text box. So the section that we are uh, going to or went over, and for those of you that did not have the opportunity to be in the class for whatever reason, um, we are going to um, go over elements. Elements was the concept that we discussed today, and I'm going to just very briefly um, share with you some of the concepts or some of the most important concepts uh, regarding elements. The first thing that we should know is that an element is basically um, pure any pure substance that cannot be decomposed into a, something simpler by chemical changes. So elements are pure substance substance that cannot be broken down into smaller components, right? Just smaller or, yeah, we'll say components. But I'm, what I'm trying to say is that if you have an element, you can't break that down into anything else. So if, for example, I have something like uh, hydrogen, that means that the atoms that make up hydrogen are just hydrogen atoms. So there are hydrogen is not going to be composed of anything, any other atom, uh, atom, excuse me. And hydrogen um, is a pure substance. And, and that's what, it, that's why hydrogen is an element because I can't break hydrogen down into something smaller. The atom of hydrogen, the atom of hydrogen is the smallest um, possible or the simplest possible way that that can be broken down. Now, obviously hydrogen can form compounds um, such as water or hydroxide. And of course, if I break those down, then of course they're not elements, they're pure substances. So if I have water, um, and, and this is just to illustrate that H2O, um, I can't break, I can break water down because it's not uh, um, a pure substance. It's actually right a compound. So I can break that down into hydrogen and oxygen. So that's the first thing. Okay. And what we're going to talk about today is how they're arranged in the periodic table. So it's very important to understand that the elements serve, first of all, we talked about what an element is. Now, uh, also very important that we know that an element serve at serve or elements serve, excuse me, Elements serve as the building blocks, blocks of matter, okay? So very important to understand that, that elements serve as the building block of matter. And that means that most matter or, um, or what we call matter, which is anything that has mass and occupies space, in one way or another is composed of elements, um, be it hydrogen uh, or carbon, which is the third most abundant uh, element in the, in the, in the universe. Um, they... Uh, have mass and occupy space, and of course they are elements. So again, elements is the building block of matter. So all matter that surrounds us is in fact um, composed of an element. And what we're going to talk about today is the periodic table. Now, um, one thing that is very important is that each element has um, a characteristic property. So mainly in the periodic table, elements are either metals or non-metals, and each uh, element has a characteristic properties. So elements have a characteristic properties. Okay. So very important. Very important is, and here's again, three uh, pretty important things about elements. Number one is that elements are pure substances and they cannot be broken down into anything simpler. Elements are the building blocks of matter because 
matter, which is anything that has mass and occupies space, is in fact composed of an element. And of course, that elements have a characteristic property. Now, all elements are actually, and I'm going to go ahead and clear all my drawings, um, elements are actually um, arranged in the periodic table of the elements, which of course we all know and have heard of. But one very important thing is that in the in the periodic table, elements are arranged into groups based on their chemical properties. So in the periodic table, elements are organized into groups based on their chemical properties. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, uh, more in depth into groups and periods and all that stuff. But just so you know, so in the periodic table of the elements, groups are actually, um, or elements are actually arranged into groups based on their chemical properties. Another thing that uh, is not necessarily in your textbook, but it's good to know is that there are 92 92, okay, uh, elements yet or naturally occurring elements. Or 92 different types of atoms. Of atoms that make up elements. There are 92 different types of atoms that make up elements, but there are like 119 or 120 elements in the periodic table. And that's because we're going to find out a little bit later on that some elements are not necessarily naturally occurring, but they're synthesized in the lab and have different properties or, or different or specific uses. But there are 92 uh, elements that actually are occur or are found in nature. So... Um, let's talk a little bit about the periodic table. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the elements in the periodic table. And I'm just going to very briefly uh, summarize the, the elements or the, the content that you'll see in your book. I'm actually on section 1.3 of your textbooks. Um, and it says that each small square, so in an element, uh, and obviously I can't illustrate the square here, but let's say we have, I don't know, uh, hydrogen, which is the easiest one to use. And hydrogen has an atomic number, and also it has. Um, and so, if we look at hydrogen, you can you usually you'll usually find hydrogen with a number one over it, and that's what we call the atomic number. So, when elements in the periodic table are basically formed in squares or have squares, and they usually have a number up top, which is what we call. Um, the atomic number, okay? So it's very important to know that each small square of the periodic table shows the symbol for an element and its atomic number, okay? And again, it goes on to give you the example of hydrogen. So something very important that you um, that you need to know is that an element's name is usually... Um, so an element's name... Um, or excuse me, an element's uh, symbol is, is it refers to its to its English name. So you can often relate an element's symbol to its English name. So um, H uh, for hydrogen, right? Um, sometimes um, other elements, um, like for example, you would say copper. If you thought about copper, you would say, well, copper has to be CO, right? Copper. But in reality, that's not necessarily the case because copper is how we pronounce it in English. But um, sometimes the, the abbreviation that you find in the elements of the periodic table are actually their Latin name or sometimes even their German name. Um, because, for example, this element, which uses W, let me, let me fix that. Copper is not CO, it's CU. I'm just trying to illustrate something. Sometimes you'll find you have an element and, you know, it has a W. And you would assume, right, that the name starts with a W, but that's not the case. In reality, that element that um, has the letter W is actually tungsten, which comes from its German name, all right? So elements of the periodic table can be related to the, or the names of the elements in the periodic table can re be related to their names in English, Latin, or in the case of tungsten, a German. 
Okay. Um, now, if we go on to the next page, we have a picture of the periodic table of the elements. And um, one of the things, so I'm actually going to try to draw the periodic table. So give me one second here. And if I were to draw the periodic table, so the periodic table is usually arranged. Uh, it, it looks kind of something like this, right? And you have this down here, and then uh, you'll have it go up again. And so that's really a bad drawing of a periodic table of the elements. But I just want to illustrate the point. I, it's like, so elements that are arranged horizontally, obviously from top to bottom, um, we call, and you have a very good illustration of that in your book, but elements that are arranged vertically or from top to bottom are called groups or families, and they are numbered from 1 to 18 from left to right. Um, and it says that um, the groups contain elements with similar chemical properties, okay? So the vertical columns of the periodic table are called groups. So right here, this is called a group. And if you look in your textbook, you'll see the periodic table there, and you see that these are called group. And they're numbered, okay? Each group is numbered, um, and they're numbered from 1 to 18, okay? And they are arranged... Um, or, or the groups or families are arranged by similar chemical properties. So that means that the that the if, if we'll call this group one right here, that means that all of elements below group one have similar chemical properties. So again, real important to understand that groups groups are arranged vertically. vertically and the elements in the group have similar chemical properties. So if they're vertically, they're arranged in groups and they have similar chemical properties, okay? So um, if you continue to move, and, and they're numbered, of course, from 1 to 18. Now, it, it says that the elements in group 2 are beryllium, magnesium, calcium, and stromium, um, barium, and radium. All of these elements are reactive metals with similar abilities to bond to other kinds of atoms. The two major categories of elements are metals and non-metals. So again, um, and you can use your textbook, but basically all the elements in group two have the same or similar chemical properties. So group two would be about, um, is the second group. And they say, and, and basically it also says that all the metal, all the majority of the elements are arranged in metals or non-metals. And then we have the horizontal rows of the elements in the periodic table, which are called periods. So if we go to the periodic table, um, and again, this is a pretty bad drawing of a periodic table, but I want you guys to use your books um, and use that as reference, not my drawings. But um, if we look at the horizontal groups, okay, the horizontal groups in the periodic in the periodic table are called periods. Okay, so from left to right, they're called periods, and the verticals are called groups or families, and the horizontal are called period, the horizontal rows. Okay, and it says that physical and chemical properties change somewhere or somewhat, excuse me, regularly across a period. That means that if I have lithium, let's say I have, uh, or calcium, let me see. I think, let me see if I'm correct. Lithium, I think, is the next one. Yeah, lithium. So if, or you know what? I will use sodium. No, pardon me, guys. I will use potassium. I think it's better explained with potassium. So if I have potassium, what um, that is saying, and potassium is, is represented with the letter K, what that is saying is that as I move further out horizontally, and we have potassium here, and let's say down here we have 
chromium, which is down here. Chromium, which is CR. Now, what it's saying is that the farther the uh, elements are from one another in a, on a period, um, the the more variables the properties will be. Um, it's physical and chemical properties, okay? So so that's what that sentence is trying to illustrate in the book, okay? Um, it says that elements that are close to each other in the same period tend to be similar than elements that are farther apart. So again, so for example, next to, next to, um, next to potassium, I actually have calcium. So that means that calcium, which is right here, CA, that calcium would have more in common with its physical and chemical properties to, potas to pota potassium, excuse me, than chromium would because they're closer to each other, okay? Um, and uh, it says, however, their properties are very different from the properties of fluorine because fluorine is very, 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 very far away in the periodic table, okay? So that's what it's trying to say. The farther an element is in a period, the, the more their properties vary. It says, and it goes on to explain that the two sets of elements placed below the periodic table make up what we call the actinides and lactonides. So remember that I said that some elements were farther away and I'm going to try to draw them down here. Usually at between 57 and 89, you'll have uh, elements that are down here in the periodic table. And these are what we call the lactonines and the actinines. And they are elements, and again, I, part, I apologize for the quality of my drawings. I'm getting used to this. Um, and these elements down here, the lactonines and the actinines, um, are between 57 and 89, and the reason that they're down here is so that the periodic table doesn't look so wide. Because if you were to fit these into the periodic table, you have a huge periodic table, and and the periodic periodic table is pretty big to to begin with. Okay, so um, those are the lactonides and the actinides. The other important concept is that we want to know, or that um, um, that is good for you guys to know is that the periodic table of the elements is divided into metal and non-metals essentially, okay? So I'm going to actually go ahead and write this down here. Um, in, the, we, in the periodic table, we basically have metals and non-metals, okay? Um, it says that the periodic table is broadly divided into two main sections, metals and non-metals. So the periodic table... And I already mentioned this before, is um, mainly divided or broadly divided into metals and non-metals, okay? Um, and the other thing is that metals in the periodic table are more towards the left and the center of the periodic table, okay? And the non-metals are more towards the right. So if we go back to this very, very interesting illustration, all the metals that are to the left, or all the elements, excuse me, that are to the left, right here, let me see if I can get a different color. Um, okay, so let me see if this works. So basically all the elements that are to the left, which are down here, right here with let's say potassium and um, and chlorine, or, or excuse me, and calcium. Give me one sec. So here between, um, so the uh, potassium and calcium right here, these are metals, and all the way to other center, there are metals. But if we look at the right where the noble gases are, and you have, uh, uh, we'll say, uh, chlorine over here, and of course that's not where chlorine is illustrated, but... That's just so you guys have an idea. So all the elements that are to the left and all the are, are in the center are metals, and essentially all the elements to the right are non-metals. Okay, they're they're mainly gases. Now we do have elements that are called metalloids that are in between. There are they have properties similar to metals and non and non-metals. Okay, so um, again, 
the and then another uh, interesting thing that your book goes on to say is that um the most important character now they talk we're going to talk a little bit about metals and your book um basically defines a metal metal essentially as a good conductor of electricity and heat although of course um metals are also shiny and have kind of like that, like that um well, yeah shiny and that luster that's the word i was looking for and that luster metals are mainly uh, gray and kind of have a like a whitish luster although of course we have gold that and copper which are um the ex they're, they're not um white or grayish so again a metal is an, is referred to as a conductor of a good conductor of ele uh, of um electricity another important thing important correct characteristic of metals is their malleability so metals are malleable okay and what i mean by malleable is that they are that i can shape them into things like i can i can fold them and i can make sheets for example aluminum is a very malleable uh, metal because I can I can turn it into different things. So is gold, um, and and most metals are malleable. That means that you can beat them down and turn them into something. And of course, this is this is very true in the Bronze Era. If we talk a little bit about history and all this stuff, so most metals are solid at room temperature, except for mercury. Mercury is actually a liquid at room temperature. Okay, so um, that's a little bit of, of of the properties of metals, and we're going to talk a little bit about non-metals in a minute. Okay, now um, non-metals, and let's actually go ahead and and define a non-metal. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the non-metals and non-metals. Um, your book essentially defines non-metals as an element that is a poor conductor of heat and electricity. So a non-metal is an element that is a poor conductor of heat and electricity. Okay? So, yeah, I'm sorry. I think I misspelled electricity there, but um, you guys, you guys will get the drift. Electricity. Um, so that's essentially what a non-metal is, and um, many non non-metals are essentially gases. Not all of them. Not all of them. But it's good to point out that many non-metals are gases at room temperature. And that includes elements such as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, or what we know as chon. Um, and, you know, most uh, of the substances or most of the compounds, I think that's the word I'm looking for, most of the compounds that we have on Earth, in Earth, or on Earth, excuse me, are, are made of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, including the air that we breathe. They have a mixture of uh, oxygen, uh, nitrogen is also present, okay, and other elements. So nonmetals are essentially gases at room temperatures. Not all of them, but uh, most of them. And, uh, for example, one of the... the the exam of one of the exceptions is actually phosphorus okay so phosphorus which is represented with the uh letter p is a solid it's a non-metal but it's a solid okay and it's actually one of five um solid non-metal phosphorus is an example of a solid non-metal okay it's one of five 
but that's an example that goes to show that not all non-metals are gases. The majority are, especially in the periodic table. If we go to like the, um, if we go to the, to the noble gases, but they're not the only ones. And 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 speaking of phosphorus, um, it's interesting to know that phosphorus is too reactive. It will react with anything. In fact, there are a bunch of phosphorus compounds such as phosphate, for example, which is used in, uh, it's found in, in some things such as like detergents and, and other elements. Um, it's so reactive that it doesn't exist in nature as a pure substance, okay? It's actually um, present in huge quantities in what we call phosphate rock, which is basically phosphorus combined with oxygen and calcium. So you'll see phosphorus deposits in certain parts of the world and um it's because phosphorus is so reactive that it'll pretty much combine with anything. And the reason why phosphorus is like that is because it's an unstable element and it combines to uh, maintain stability. Um, or it's not that it's an unstable, like it'll blow up in your face kind of element, but it's pretty unstable. So that's why it's or, or reactive. And that's why you'll find it in nature combined with other elements. More importantly, uh, oxygen, or more commonly, oxygen and calcium, which is like phosphorus, that kind of solid form of, of phosphorus, all right? Um, and the other thing that we're going to talk about real quick is... Um, the elements in group 18. So we already established that in the periodic table, all elements um, grouped vertically are called groups. And the elements in group 18 are the noble gases. And they are very stable. So elements in group 18, in group 18, are called the noble gases. And those elements or those noble gases are very stable um, and they very rarely react to anything, okay? They have a low reactivity. And so the noble gases have low reactivity, low reactivity are mainly stable. And understanding that they're stable, we'll see that a little bit later on as we progress in the course, but basically that they're stable means that they maintain their configuration. And um, they are gases at room temperature, whereas uh, other gases um, or other elements are gases in higher temperatures. And then we talk a little bit about the metalloids. So let me actually go here and see if I can type down the definition of a metalloid. And a metalloid is basically an element that has some characteristics of metals and other characteristics as non-metal. So metalloids have characteristics of metals and non-metals and another important thing about um, metalloids is that they are solids at room temperature all metalloids are solid at room temperature Okay, metalloids have characteristics of metals and non-metals and are solids at room temperature. And one last thing is that metalloids tend to be semiconductors of electricity. Okay, metalloids, metalloids, tend to be semiconductors. Okay. That means that they conducts because they have properties of metals, they do conduct some electricity. Not as good as metals, but they um, tend to be semiconductors.
Metalloids tend to be semiconductors of electricity. And also, metalloids, another very important thing about metalloids is that they're used in the solid state circuitry found in desktop computers. So metalloids that are solid are found in the circuitry of desktop computers. Solid, so we can say solid metalloids can be found. in the circuitry in the circuitry circuitry I'm sorry for a minute my computer froze of desktop desk up computers so there you go, guys. That is a very brief summary of the section 1.3 of the textbook, okay, where we talk about the elements and the arrangement of the elements in the periodic table. So um, if you have any questions, you know where to find me. All of your material is already posted to your LMS. So stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next class. Bye.